Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland, and our special. I don't know if we've ever done this. Well, well, we've come close. I'm sure we must. Have no, been. no, no. When Dan I was am in literally studio. near the 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 dump in Secaucus. You know, you say you're near the Gowanus Canal. I'm near a different dump. You are. That's right. So you we're are. double dump broadcasting. That's what I meant in terms of we've never done it before. Maybe let's not brand it like that. New Jersey is huh? actually quite, I would say, known for its industrial waste. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, Unfortunately I, I think, so. From the but Sopranos I, theme, theme uh, <laughs> uh, graphics. I think Emma just... has a good point that the double dump broadcast, probably <laughs> not. That was what we're I going I literally for. have the logo being made. You're saying I shouldn't? I'm saying maybe. Hold. I'd actually like to see what the logo looks like. And then uh, and then we can. It's, it's about yeah. what you would expect. I think it's it's pretty much. All right. I will. Now, I know this is like not exactly the, the funnest of, of fun topics, mm -hmm. but this is important because um this this piece you did about uh, FERC uh, mm -hmm. just and you'll give us we'll, we'll do it briefly but this era of the Biden era um you know at least you know looking at it narrowly in terms of d domestically is the first I feel like of my lifetime or at least you know when I was out of elementary school um but maybe even then where we have like industrial policy from the government like a cohesive one and the tariffs are part of that but also um uh, this other story about like you know our grid and you know what's happening in terms of uh planning permitting and paying um as you write like we're, we're really seeing some industrial policy yeah so i mean one of the persistent problems with decarbonizing with with creating a clean energy future is literally connecting all of these renewable energy sources to the electric grid so that it can get to consumers we're rapidly transitioning to electric vehicles we're rapidly transitioning to you know electric appliances and homes and things like that but if you can't get the new cleaner energy onto the grid you're just going to use the same dirty sources uh and and you know, you're just, you won't get there. So uh, that's why transmission, building transmission lines is so important. And uh, the administration uh, through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission just- and let, let me just ask you one more question about yeah. that, just the, in the premise. Mm -hmm. Because as it stands now, the, the I would imagine that the transmission lines that we need from the source to whatever sort of distri distributes it on the grid have to be m a, a multiple of what we have now because the amount of energy that comes maybe from like a uh you know a solar farm here and a wind farm there and maybe hydro here um are not necessarily going to be as concentrated as they were for let's say coal it's kind of two things uh we need more connections, more grid, more power lines to get from those remote places where energy is produced with places with a lot of wind, places with a lot of sun to where energy is consumed. So, so, you know, if you're building a new solar array somewhere, they just might not have lines to get you uh, right. uh, out to a, a transform. But even perhaps even more important is that the existing lines we have can only carry a certain amount of energy. However, if you, and, and this is just classic uh, uh, with the way that uh, climate and energy folks just uh, talk themselves out of talking to real people through uh, something called reconductoring. So that I'm immediately, I've, I've fallen asleep. And when you tell me about reconductoring, all that literally means is upgrading the power line upgrading the conductors or the power lines, you can push much more power across the same lines. So in and, other words, you would uh, basically reconduct them. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, there. Um, so so what uh, you, what is it, what's involved in that? Is it, is it changing uh, the material or just the diameter upgrading, of upgrading changing the wires using grid enhancing technologies and uh, uh, allowing for more power, because 
power lines are very leaky. You don't get all of the energy that goes through it actually from one place to the next. But with better technology, stronger lines, not only would you have less power loss, but more important, you would be able to put more throughput on those lines. So it's a combination of both because the more that you can just do it by re just just reconductoring by, by through the lines, the fewer built environment kind of things that you have to build. Right. Well, again, all right. So let me just do you do you know? Is it a matter a matter of changing the diameter of like? Is it uh, is it is it copper? I mean, what is the, what are these? What do we use as these transmission lines, and what needs to change about them? I'm just looking they're, in terms of like uh, my uh, commodity play that I'm going to do this <laughs> afternoon in my day I mean, trade. Copper's part of it, but I mean, uh, the I, I don't know the exact mix. Like if okay. you're telling me how what the lines made of. What I can tell you is that there are better lines than what we have out there now, which you can imagine uh, some is 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years old. Right. And so if you upgrade that technology, if you upgrade those lines, you can get more through without having to build entirely new transmission lines. So it's a combination of both. And this, this rule that was put together on Monday at FERC actually deals with both sides of that. It deals with both sides of the equation. Uh, what, it, what it says is that um, it's two parts. One is planning and one is cost allocation. So what's planning? That means that uh, power companies have to say, uh, we are going to need this much power in 20 years. And it's going to give us this many benefits if we build X more or, or create X more capacity of transmission, it's going to create these benefits for us. And that makes it worthwhile for us to do. And uh, right now, there isn't a lot of long term planning that goes on from utilities. And so that's number one. And then number two is uh, paying for it. So a lot of these things go through different regions, different states. Uh, one state's power company might say, I, I'm not going to pay for you to upgrade that other upgrade that other state's power lines. That doesn't affect me. And basically, there's, there's this huge free rider problem when it comes down to the brass tax of actually paying for uh, what you uh, need in in transmission. And so there's no real prior to Monday, there is no real equation for how you set out, okay, you, this state number one, you're going to pay this much state number two, you're going to pay this much. And they set out a process now to deal with that cost allocation, which I'm told is even bigger of a problem than permitting. And it makes sense, right? Because like paying for it sure. is a thing. That right. And so I could be state number one over, over here, over here and uh, state number two here, and I may need to do more work over here, but the benefit is going to happen here as well. Uh, right. And so the question is like, who pays for it? Right. And then presumably that those, the, that cost is, is passed on to uh, the, the consumer to basically to- Well, I mean, there's, uh, th this is one problem with this is that the, the utilities don't want to spend the money, particularly on the upgrades because upgrades are seen really? as- yeah, the upgrades are seen as maintenance. They're not seen as capital expenditures. And you can pass through a capital expenditure to your ratepayers, but you can't pass a, a maintenance upgrade through to your ratepayers. So even though it's critical for them, like it would be much cheaper if they just upgraded the lines, right? Uh, than having to build new things. But the incentives are towards building new things because that money I can make the ratepayers pay for. Well, I have a good suggestion. I, I have a suggestion. Let's nationalize these uh, entities and not worry about it anymore. Now, all well, of a sudden, you work for the U.S. government. Do what we told you. You get the same salaries. It's just now we don't have shareholders. We don't have to worry about it. We'll be able to drop the rates for everybody. And we'll actually build a grid that's going to be durable, sustainable, and well, uh, more efficient. Work, it seems to work for the Tennessee Valley Authority, right? So No kidding. Uh, we, we absolutely have to think about this this investor owned utility era 
that we're in and whether so they're going to dumb. put forward uh, the kinds of uh, upgrades and, and technical capabilities that we need to actually get to 100% renewable energy. They're basically crying out and saying, we can't do it under the, uh, I mean, this is a perfect example, perfect example of, you know, where private enterprise fails because right. there's no incentive for them. They're, they're making their, whatever it is that the, they're regulated to, to make in terms of profit, seven, well, 8%, whatever well, it is. Well, one of the things they're saying is we can't pay for it. And so now we've set up a process that says, no, you can like, here's, here's, what it's going to cost and if 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 we're going to go forward there's the permitting side but there actually were some previously previous to this FERC meeting there were some uh, additions the about the biden administration made uh including with respect to reconductoring where you wouldn't have to get a new environmental review to essentially upgrade the lines um so uh that's going to be helpful as well uh so uh, Basically, the people that I've talked to are, are pretty happy about where this all landed. There was some question because uh, there are three commissioners on FERC right now, and one is a Republican who didn't want to do anything, and the other was a, a climate hawk Democrat that really wanted to do a lot. And there was this guy, the chair, Willie Phillips, who like comes out of utilities. He, he worked for Pepco uh, or with Pepco, and it was unclear what side he was going to go on, but according to what I've heard, uh, the rule reflects more of the uh, the climate hawk side of the equation. How often are these uh, uh, FERC commissioners uh, appointed? How long are their terms? Do you know? Uh, I believe they are uh, four or five year terms. There were two that were just, uh, uh, you know, there are two vacancies right now. One of them is because Joe Manchin decided not to give a hearing to the, the former chair. And so that guy had to leave the commission. This is why we had this oh, this this, uh, this rule was proposed two years ago, and we're only getting to it now in part because they ditched the guy who wrote it, this guy Rich Glick, and uh, they had to you know basically get everybody up to speed. So there are two vacancies now, and uh, Biden has named replacements, and one of them. Uh, worked for Manchin. He he was uh, a staff. Oh, Jesus. Manchin. So it's good that we get this in now before that uh, that that hits. Um, right. But you know that could be a problem with the implementation of this. Unbelievable. They finalized the rule, but that doesn't mean you know they're gonna they're gonna follow it and abide by it. We got uh, an IM or asking how it affects the privatized Texas grid. Oh, good question. Um, that, that is a good question. Uh, you know, it, these are still U.S. facilities. Uh, there are three grids, right? There's a northern, a eastern grid, a western grid, and a Texas grid. Uh, but even though they are separate entities from one another, I think it's still, I think it does still affect the uh, the, the ability for ERCOT to, uh, uh, you know, the, the mandate on them to engage in this long-term planning. 